Chapter 4. Startling Phone Call Bud whirled into action and darted out the front door of the studio. He collided head-on with the man in the turban. The jolt left Bud speechless for a moment. Recovering, he gripped the man's arm and demanded, Why were you spying on us? I beg your pardon, but I was not. The dark-featured man shook off Bud's arm. I was merely passing the window on my way to enter the studio and happened to glance in. Now, will you please allow me to get by? Okay. Bud stood aside and stared at him in a baffled surprise. The stranger adjusted his white, gold-threaded turban, then walked in. My name is Mirza, he said. Is Mr. Tom Swift Jr. here? Everyone looked at him in surprise. Tom spoke up. I'm Tom Swift. The man bowed and made a gesture in salam. I am the secretary of Mr. Nuhan Flambeau, the head of Pan-Islamic Engineering Associates. Mr. Flambeau is now at your atomic research station and urgently wishes to confer with you. Mr. Flambeau, the secretary explained, had flown from the Middle East via New York for the sole purpose of seeing Tom Swift. After landing in New Mexico, he had taken a car directly from the airport to the Citadel. There, Mr. Flambeau had learned of Tom Swift's road trip to Taos, and had sent Mirza to summon him back at once. Why didn't he come to Taos himself? Bud demanded. Mirza merely shrugged. Tom, too, was somewhat irritated by the high-handed demand. Evidently, Flambeau was accustomed to having people jump when he issued orders. On the other hand, if he had flown all the way from the Middle East, there must be an important reason, and it seemed only polite to see him. Tom frowned a moment, then said, Sorry to break our outing, Phil and Sandy, but maybe I'd better go back. Bud, suppose you and the girls stay here. Mr. Merzer can drop me back. According to arriving at the Citadel, Tom found his visitor pacing back and forth in the lobby of his reception building. Flambeau, a gaunt, hawk-nosed man with a trim black beard, greeted Tom with an angry glare. I have been waiting here for over four hours, he complained as they shook hands. A call or telegram that you were coming would have saved us both some inconvenience, Tom returned evenly. I hope you have been comfortable, Flambeau snorted. A ridiculous-looking cowboy brought me lunch, a concoction of rattlesnake meat. Naturally, I was unable to touch it. Tom repressed a grin. Chow probably thought he was praying you in honor. He does prepare, uh, unusual delicacies at times. As he spoke, Tom looked over his visitor carefully. Flambeau was dressed impeccably in a suit of shimmering gray silk. Tom's eye was caught by his ruby tie clasp. Perhaps we can talk more comfortably in my office, Tom said. As they walked across the grounds toward one of Tom's lab's buildings, the young inventor remarked, I can't help admiring your tie clasp, sir. That's a Kabulistan ruby, isn't it? Flambeau barred his white teeth in a sneer. I fear your knowledge of rubies is not so expert as your scientific skill, my dear Mr. Swift. This happens to be a pigeon blood's ruby, a gift from a colleague in India. My mistake, Tom said with a smile. When they reached the office, adjoining a lab, Tom offered his guest a chair and sat down behind his desk. What can I do for you, Mr. Flambeau? My company, Pan Islamic Engineering Associates, is making a great contribution to the Middle East, Flambeau said proudly. We are building roads, bridges, and refineries, all with technicians from our own countries. A far better way than letting greedy outsiders get a foothold. Tom nodded. I believe science knows no national boundaries. All countries have a right to share in scientific progress. Flambeau scowled. Unfortunately, some countries use their scientific leadership to impose their will on less advanced areas. Some do, Tom agreed coolly. Not the United States. Flambeau shrugged impatiently. In any case, my company could make good use of your new, small-sized atomic dynamo. We are therefore prepared to offer any price within reason for the sole industrial rights to your invention. Tom was startled. Then a smile spread over his face. That's the second time in a few days I've had such an offer, Mr. Flambeau. My, my answer to both answers is no. When and if my midget power plant is perfected, I intend to sell a lease it for whatever it can help, for use wherever it can help mankind. Flambeau's eyes blazed. Meaning wherever you can use it as a tool for getting advantage over weaker countries, he stormed. The telephone rang. Tom picked it up, listened a few moments, then replaced the receiver with an amused look. Excuse me a minute, sir, Tom told Flambeau. Your secretary, Mirza, seems to be trying to get a foothold where he doesn't belong. Tom hurried outside and found Chow Winkler holding Mirza tightly bound in the loop of his lariat. 
Out the sidewinder, sneaking past my galley window. Snooping, the Texan reported. Mirza was quivering, quivering, either from anger or fear. Tom could not decide which. The secretary's face looked livid as he muttered something unintelligible. All right, let him go, Chow. I'll take over, Tom said. He warned his prisoner. An atomic research station is a dangerous place to go wandering around, Mirza. Don't try it again. Reckon you'd better keep an eye on that boss of his, too, Chow warned. I never did trust a critter that don't appreciate good vittles. Tom grinned and started back to his office. Mirza accompanied him silently. In the meantime, Flambeau's temper seemed to have cooled down. Your answer to my offer, then, is a flat refusal? He asked Tom. I'm afraid it will have to be, sir. Then there is no further point in my remaining here. Flambeau turned and snapped an order to secretary in what sounded like Arabic. Tom politely but firmly insisted on accompanying them to their rented car. Then he watched until the guard at the gate flagged them through. Guess I may as well get back to work now that I'm here, Tom thought. Twenty minutes later, he was pouring a batch of molten metal from a miniature electronic furnace into a keg. The white-hot mass was the new alloy, lunite, with a .007 percentage of the stable isotope. Tom was wearing protective dark goggles and abestalon gloves and apron. Suddenly, as he finished pouring, Tom's ears caught a hissing, crackling noise behind him. He turned and gave a gasp of fear. His workbench was a mass of flames, which were shooting perilously close to a shelf full of flammable chemicals. Tom pushed an alarm bell and grabbed up a fire extinguisher. Luckily, he was able to douse the flames even before help arrived. What happened? the chief of the fire crew asked, after making sure the danger was past. I'm not sure, Tom shoved up his goggles and began poking around the scorched debris. Oh, oh, here's the answer, he announced a moment later. The electrical lead to my glass pyrometer rod must have shorted. There's a kink here, where the insulation probably frayed. The men left. Then, Tom repaired the damaged electrical lead and went back to work. That night, when Bud, Sandy, and Phil returned from Taos, the four young people enjoyed a snack of hamburgers and milk in the laboratory. Bud scowled suspiciously after hearing of the blaze, and asked, Did you say Flambeau stayed in your office when you went to rescue that sneaky secretary? Tom nodded. Then how do you know he wasn't responsible for that electrical short? Bud demanded. He could have slipped into the lab while you were gone. Tom frowned. It's possible. But why should he? Nevertheless, before going to bed that night, Tom sent a radio message to Harlan Ames at Enterprises. And he asked the security key to check into both Flambeau and Pan-Islamic Engineering Associates. Some time after midnight, Tom was roused by the telephone jangling on his bedside table. He groped sleepily for the instrument. Hello? Tom Swift speaking. This is Ben Garth in Taos, said the voice at the other end of the line. I just surprised a thief breaking into my studio. Thought I'd better let you know right away. He was that man with the turban who came here looking for you. Alright, sorry it's two days late. Um, this chapter's short, but it's probably one of my favorites. <laughs>